Um, my name is Kent Saikawa. Um, I'm a junior faculty at Kanazawa University. Uh, today, I'd like to give a talk about our recent paper, uh, Primordial Gravitational Waves in a Minimal Model of Particle Physics and Cosmology. And this work uh, is based on, uh, based on the collaboration with Andreas Ringwald at DAISY and Carlos Tamarit at TUM Kahin. Uh, primordial gravitational waves originating from tensor fluctuations during inflation are uh, important prediction of inflation theory. Uh, usually, the spectrum of primordial gravitational waves are uh, described by this quantity omega GW, uh, which is the ratio of the energy density of gravitational waves in the logarithmic interval to the critical density of the universe. And we can further decompose this quantity uh, in terms of two factors uh, that correspond to uh, two important information uh, obtained from the observation of this quantity. One is the primordial tensor power spectrum, uh, which is determined uh, from the dynamics during inflation and contains the information about inflation and models. And the other is uh, transfer function uh, which uh, describes uh, how gravitational waves propagate after inflation. And this contains the information about the thermal history after infl inflation. And in order to uh, calculate the spectrum of gravitational waves, uh, we have to know both of these two quantities by fixing the models in the R universe. So this picture uh, shows um, some uh, uh, rough picture of the evolution of gravitational wave mode in the information cosmology. The y-axis is a log of the length scale and the x-axis is a log of the scale factor. Uh, this white line uh, describes the evolution of the Hubble horizon scale and this red, uh, this orange line uh, shows the evolution of the uh, wavelengths of gravitational wave mode. Now, the gravitational waves is produ produced uh, at some point in the, during inflation and it, uh, it crosses the horizon and go beyond the horizon scale during inflation. And uh, at some point in the later time after inflation, it uh, re-enter the horizon. And we can, uh, uh, we call this time as a horizon crossing time. And the, before this horizon crossing time, the uh, amplitude of gravitational waves is frozen. And after that, uh, it starts to evolve. And considering this fact, um, we can see that uh, the frequency of gravitational waves uh, is uh, given by the Hubble parameter at the horizon crossing. So basically, the uh, higher frequency of gravitational waves uh, correspond to the modes that enter the horizon at earlier epoch. So one interesting uh, fact is that uh, we can prove the equation of the state of the universe by looking at the spectrum of gravitational waves. Um, after the gravitational wave, wave mode enters the horizon, uh, it simply evolves as radiation, implying that uh, the energy density of gravitational waves scales proportional to the uh, scale factor to minus four while the background energy density evolves according to the equation of state of the universe. So the amplitude of gravitational waves are proportional to uh, some factor that depends on the equation of state, uh, multiplied by uh, uh, amplitude at the horizon crossing, where the horizon, uh, amplitude of at horizon crossing is given by the primordial tensor uh, amplitude. So this is given by the inflation scale. Now, if we, uh, we compare uh, the gravitational wave amplitude between two different frequencies, then uh, it is proportional to the, uh, the factor that depends on the change of the equation of state between these two um, horizon crossing epoch. And in the radiation dominated universe, uh, this factor is proportional to the ratio of uh, uh, 
uh, this star function that describes the effective degrees of freedom of radiations and given by this, this formula. So if there is a change of the equation of state or a change in the effective degrees of freedom in the R universe, uh, we expect that this affects the spectrum of primary gravitational waves. So this is a typical uh, spectrum of inflationary gravitational waves predicted in the, in the standard slow low inflationary models. Um, and we see that uh, the, the basically there, uh, this is a nearly flat spectrum. And on top of that, uh, there are some features uh, due to uh, the various post inflationary events. Uh, for instance, uh, the matter radiation quality uh, uh, leads to some change in the equation of state. So the, the slope of the gravitational wave spectrum changes around here. And also uh, E plus E minus annihilation and QCD crossover leads to some changes in the uh, uh, effective degrees of freedom. And this uh, uh, sh show up at the break, breaks uh, on the gravitational wave spectrum. And, um, and since the frequency of gravitational waves is related to the uh, Hubble parameter at the horizon crossing, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the frequency and um, temperature at the horizon crossing. So we can also write, uh, show the spectrum of gravitational waves as a function of the um, horizon crossing temperature and higher frequency gravitational waves corresponds to uh, the mode that enter the horizon at their high, higher temperatures. Um, it is a bit, uh, a bit, bit challenging to uh, probe the primordial gravitational waves, uh, but uh, at least there are two possibilities to uh, observe uh, this inflation gravitational waves. The leading possibility is a CMB, uh, by looking at the B-mode polarization, polarization patterns on CMB, we can probe the primordial gravitational waves at a frequency uh, as, low, uh, as low as uh, 10 to the minus 70 hertz. Uh, this is very low frequency uh, due to the fact that uh, CMB is basically uh, sensitive to the modes that enter the horizon at the recombination epoch. On the other hand, there is a uh, another possibility uh, that we can probe the uh, inflation and gravitation waves in the future space form interferometers such as PBO or DSIGO. And uh, important fact is that these experiments are sensitive uh, to the gravitation waves at their frequency ranges of 0.1 to 1 hertz, which is uh, much larger than the CMB scale. And if we look at this uh, formula, uh, or for the frequency of gravitational waves, uh, we immediately see that the frequency range of 0.1 to 1 hertz are probed by future spaceborne gravitational wave experiments uh, corresponds to uh, the modes which re enter the horizon at the temperature of 10 to 8 GeV. So uh, we can say, th uh, in this sense, we can say that uh, direct detection of the gravitational waves uh, at the spaceborne gravitation of the experiments can uh, probe the universe at the epoch of the 10 to the 8 GeV, uh, like the CMB can probe the universe at the recombination epoch. So we should ask that uh, what happened in the universe at that, that epoch, what can we learn about our universe by uh, gravitation wave experiment? Is there any interesting new physics uh, in the perspective of these direct detection experiments. And in our recent paper, um, we pointed out that uh, the SMESH model uh, gives uh, some interesting uh, implication for this uh, gravitational wave uh, direct detection experiments. Uh, and this SMESH model was proposed by these authors uh, it's uh, based on a simple extension of the standard model that addresses five fundamental problems in particle physics and cosmology, uh, including inflation, value asymmetry, neutrino masses, dark matter, and strong CP problem at the same time. And uh, one important point is that this model is very predictive 
uh, because if we require that these five problems are addressed simultaneously, uh, uh, there, there's a very uh, uh, constrained parameter space in the model. And with this constrained framework, uh, we can have a definite predictions for various cosmological observables. This is a, a brief explanation of the SMASH model. So the model is constructed by adding a new complex single scalar, sigma, uh, right-handed neutrinos, and a vector-like crux uh, with, uh, all, uh, with uh, all of them are charged under U1 global Petrachin symmetry. And the, the right-handed neutrinos uh, provide the neutrino masses, the, the usual uh, CISO mechanism, and leads to the summer left genesis that explains the barrier asymmetry. And uh, these are heavy quarks are introduced uh, in order to address the strong CP problem uh, based on the case pz uh, action model. Furthermore, this model addresses the inflation uh, based on the dynamics of the Higgs and the Petrachin field. Uh, if we introduce some nonlinear coupling to gravity, uh, uh, it leads to the, some flat potential that is uh, necessary to explain the slow roll inflation and dynamics. Finally, um, after the inflation, uh, Petrachin symmetry breaks spontaneously, and uh, after that, action emerges, and that can explain the uh, uh, that, that can be the main constituent of dark matter. Um, here, uh, one important uh, fact is that uh, there is a unique prediction for the critical temperature of the Petrachin phase transition in this model. So this is uh, uh, given by this formula, which depends on various uh, model parameters. But if we require that uh, the model should solve uh, uh, various accept aspects in the cosmology, then we can have some uh, definite prediction. For instance, uh, successful inflation requires that the, the value of the self-coupling of the Petrachin scala should be within this, uh, uh, within this range. Vacuum stability uh, requires that some constraints on the Yukawa and the Higgs portal couplings. Finally, uh, if we assume that axion is the main constituent of dark matter, uh, it fixes the uh, Petrachin scale for uh, a value of the axion decay constant. And here we simply assume that uh, this is the case uh, for FA is, uh, 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 is about the 10 to 11 GeV. And by, by combining these constraints, uh, we can have a definite prediction for the critical temperature that is 10 to the 8 GeV, which is a, a very well motivated uh, temperature from the gravitation wave experiment. And we expect that uh, there is a change in the equation state around this temperature, and we calculated it uh, by minimizing the effective potential for the Petrachin field at finite temperature. And this figure shows some result the y-axis is the uh, uh, effective degrees of freedom, and the x-axis is the temperature. And we see that uh, there is a, a sharp change in the uh, effective degrees of freedom uh, due to the fact that these heavy fermions are decoupled from the summer bus uh, by acquiring the mass from the Petrachin field. And this happens in the 10 to the 8 GB and uh, it affects the spectrum of gravitational waves at uh, order one hertz. Uh, this figure shows uh, the prediction of the gravitational wave spectrum in SMASH model. And here we see, uh, we, we show four different lines corresponding to the four different choices of model parameters. And the blue line corresponds to the almost uh, uh, highest possible amplitude of the gravitational wave. And red, red line corresponds to the lowest possible amplitude for the gravitational wave predicted in these models. And uh, important, uh, interesting uh, frequency range is uh, here, 0.1 to 1 hertz. And uh, this predicted amplitude can be proved by future gravitational wave experiments such as DSIGO and BBO. 
Furthermore, if we assume that uh, the, the sensitivity of these experiments are improved further, uh, then in principle, uh, uh, there is some possibility to provide some detailed feature on this flat spectrum uh, uh, can be uh, probed in the sensitivity experiment. This possibility uh, is uh, described by uh, here, ultimate decibel. And uh, this figure shows some detailed comparison between the model prediction and experimental uh, sensitivities. Uh, the blue line uh, shows the prediction of the SMESH model. And we see that there's a step-like feature uh, in the gravitational wave spectrum around one hertz. And compared with the sensitivity of ultimate decibel, which is shown by these uh, dark yellow bars, we see that our, uh, in principle, uh, these non-trivial features can be identified uh, in these uh, high sensi sensitivity experiments. So we see that uh, there is a possibility to probe the nature of the Petyakin phase transition uh, from this high, uh, high sensitivity future gravitational wave experiments. So let me summarize my talk. Uh, we pointed out that the SMESH model gives a unique prediction for the critical temperature of the Petyakin phase transition, that is a 10 to the 8 GeV. And this temperature range corresponds to one hertz in the frequency of gravitational waves. And this is a best frequency range proved by future gravitational wave experiments. Uh, we showed that a change in the equation of state around the Petyakin phase transition leads to the break in the spectrum of, of gravitational waves in these flex frequency ranges. And this can be tested by uh, future experiments such as ultimate decibel. So this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention.